And I've got a theme verse. If, you, if you're uh, joining us for the first time in a while, I started this uh, about a, a month ago. This is just kind of where we want to see our church go over the course of this year. And so it's, our, it's becoming our tradition. We'll read this all together, this verse that you've got on the screen. Is it there? Okay, good, good. Let's read this together right now. Jesus brought this good... Okay, all right. uh, Let's try that again. Are we ready to read this all together in unison now? All right. Let's go right now. Jesus brought this good news of peace to you who are far away from him. Now, all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. You are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. And our reading for today, just just follow along as I read this. I I shared on this a couple weeks ago. I won't reference it much. But one day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water. They fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. They left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, he saw two brothers, James and John, sitting on a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets, and he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Has anybody ever thought that that's kind of a, that's kind of a strange uh, deal Jesus is walking by and he just says hey come follow me and these guys just drop everything they're doing and they go and begin to follow him well I'm going to explain why they did that and uh and, and this gives us some insight this is John chapter 1 this is the same story but a different account out of a different gospel and this is what I'm going to share out of today again the next day John stood with two of his disciples this is John the Baptist he stood with two of his disciples looking at Jesus as he walked and he said behold the lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seed them, seeing them following, he said, what do you seek? And they said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? And he said, he said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was the 10th hour. One of the two heard John speak and followed him Uh, and, And followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his brother Simon and said, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, and brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah, and you shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Now, Lord, I just pray this morning that your anointing would rest upon this message and upon the the hearer this morning. God, those who are in this room, those who are joining us online, I pray that the power of your spirit, Lord, I know your desire is not changed since you are here with the disciples, but your desire is to make us fishers of men. And so, Lord, I pray that you would equip us, that you would empower us, that you would inspire us, Lord Jesus, to, to follow after you. And then, Lord, as you work your process in our lives, we're going to be in effective use in your kingdom today. Oh, Lord, I pray you bless this people in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody say, amen. Amen. You may take a seat. Um, you know, this is, this is really, uh, this is just a phenomenal, a phenomenal passage. I, I, I love I love this, uh, this, this concept uh, uh, of catching and releasing. In fact, that's the name of this series that we're in right now, Catch and Release. Everybody say, Catch and Release. This, this concept, I, I, I had somebody come up to me uh, two weeks ago when they saw the slide and they saw the title, Catch and Release. They're like, uh, Pastor Jacob, you may need to explain what that is because uh, what they do in Hawaii, I, I don't know if there is such a thing as catch and release. It's like they've got poke them and eat them. 
uh, you know, you, you, uh, there's no, uh, you know, you poke them and then throw them back. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what this is, this is a concept. You see a sea bass there on the, uh, on the screen. And essentially what people do is there are areas that you can fish. You're not allowed to keep the fish. What you do is you catch the fish, you bring in the fish, you take a picture for Facebook or whatever, and then you throw it, you release it back. And I, I talked a couple of weeks ago just to review quickly about how Jesus, he said, he said to these, these guys who are fishing, he said, hey, come follow me. You know what Jesus was doing right there? He was fishing. Jesus fished for men. He got some individuals who were willing to come and follow after him. The second thing, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. He told Peter and Andrew, and then he later told uh, 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 the other two brothers. Uh, we just read it a second ago. Who were they? Somebody help me out real quick. Okay, I heard five names. Just Somebody said Paul. No, Paul wasn't one of them just yet. Uh, James and John were the other two. And so anyway, he, uh, sorry if I hurt your feelings if you said Paul. This is a good guess. Later he fished for Paul and later, so anyway. But uh, the second thing that he did is he, he began to teach them. In fact, I, I talked about if you want to keep a fish, one thing that you're going to have to do and, and to prepare it is you're going to have to clean that fish. You don't want to eat a dirty fish. You don't want to eat a fish with all the junk and the, and the guts and all this kind of stuff in there. And, uh, and so you'll clean that fish. And that's what Jesus does is we become disciples of his. He'll catch us. He'll clean us. But then what's, what's amazing is he said to his disciples, I'm going to teach you how to fish for people. It was exactly what he was doing. And so there was coming a time, and the disciples knew this from the very beginning, that there was going to be a time where Jesus, he said, I I want you to watch how I do this thing. I want you to watch how I live my life. I want you to watch how I minister to people. And one of these days, I'm going to send you out, and it's going to be your job to carry on what I have started here. And that's exactly what he did, and that's the releasing part of this. And guys, the same mission, the same thing is going on today. This is what the Lord desires to do. I don't know why it is that you came into church today. Uh, hopefully it's because you, you want to grow in the Lord. You want to hear what the Lord has to say to you today. But I'm, I'm telling you, if you have not begun this process of being discipled, if God is not actively working in your life, cleaning you up and preparing you to carry something, I, I think it's kind of sad that, that my wife asks a minute ago, how many life group leaders do we have? And I, I know not everybody raised their hand, but we need more individuals who are going to step up and into ministry and leading life groups and things. That's part of discipleship. This is a great learning uh, environment right here, what we've got. uh, You know, one of the things that we're praying for is for 30,000 disciples to be within the KC family around the world. And what we mean by disciples, we're not just talking about people who come and sit in a chair on a Sunday morning all around the world. We're talking about people who are actively involved in either a ministry or involved in a life group. This means that they are integrated into what we're doing here as a church family. That's a big difference. Most churches would be satisfied. Oh, no, we'll just count the attendees that we've got. No, we want people actively involved in what's going on here. And so I, I, would, I'm, I'm, I hope that you're, you're hearing a challenge that comes into your heart and that you would begin to ask, Lord, what is, what is my part in fulfilling the vision of KC? What's my part in fulfilling the great commission that you've left the church with? And so um, just begin to to examine your own heart as I work through this. Now, what I like about John, the gospel of John, is probably my favorite gospel because what it does is... uh, I No, they're okay. Let them go. Let them go. That's, That's fun. So that's... I love it. If if the microphone was blasting, but man, that's that's fun that the kids are having right there. So uh, um, uh, I appreciate you being ready to jump into action. But I like our kids having fun, man. I, you know what I want? I want our kids leaving. You, the reason that we got plugged into the last church that my wife and I spent the last four and a half years in was because our kids absolutely loved it. Our kids just absolutely loved it. And so we had some other churches that we liked, but the reason that we decided that's where we're going to dig roots is just that you had an amazing children's program. And so I hope, I hope if you got kids in the back there, uh, man, I, I hope that they're just 
they're constantly pulling on your shirt. I want to go back to church. I want to get there on Monday. I want to get there on Thursday. I just want to have the best children's program. That's why we do legacy fund and things like that. So anyway, one of the things that I like about the gospel of John is he gives us some insight. It was actually the last of the four gospels that was written. And so what happened is you got like Mark. And if you notice, Mark is a very short book. You can read it. Uh, it's about half the length of what many of the others are. And so you read Mark, and the reason that it's short is because Jesus had gone to heaven, right? He descended, and, and the ministry was done. But the writer, Mark, he, what he wanted to do is he wanted this message to be out there for as many to hear it right now right? Many, uh, and so what they did is he began to write this thing, and they got it out there, and that's why it's a short, it's a condensed version. It doesn't have all the details of all of the, all of the events of Christ, but uh, it got out there. Years later, and, and pretty close to the same time, Matthew and Luke came in, and they, they added more details to this thing. Luke was a historian. He was a physician, and so they began to add more details, but then many years later, John comes along. Now, this is nearly 60 years after the ministry of Jesus that the apostle John begins to write his gospel, and what's neat about this is he he's now seen these other books that have been written, and he gets he's filling in some of the details, and so this is one of the things that I, as, as that verse that we read, I always thought that it was strange. I would picture this, even as a young boy, Jesus walking by the, the water, you know, the Sea of Galilee, and calling out hey, you two guys, come and follow me. Now, I was always taught as a young boy, don't follow strangers, don't go with strangers. And so I always thought it was interesting. Why would these guys just drop what they were doing? I mean, they were working. John and, and, uh, and, and help, me, help me, what was it? John and James, thank you. John and James were uh, there with the father. And, uh, you know, they just leave him in the boat. Like, what is up with that? And so if you read, if you, if you realize what we read just a moment ago in the, in the Gospel of John, did you know that most of the disciples before they were disciples of Jesus were actually disciples of John the Baptist? In fact, that's one of the things that we read right there. It's the second time that John the Baptist has seen now Jesus approaching. And John says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. People in that day knew they were waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for the one who was going to come, bring a new covenant, eradicate sin, provide a new way for people to, to, to be born again. They knew they were waiting for this Christ, this Messiah. And John the Baptist, the forerunner, the preparer of the path for Jesus, he looks and he says, that's the one right there. That is all he did. John the Baptist, he trained for 30 years. He got this message deep into his heart. And what he did is for six months, I want you to think about this. How many of you would like to go into a 30-year training for ministry and have your ministry only be six months long? That's what John the Baptist did. But what John did is multitudes came out to see this man, this man who was on fire. He was the first significant prophet who came to the scene in over 400 years. People were hungry to see and to hear what God was doing and what God was saying. And so they did. The multitudes came out. And John's message was the same. He told the people to repent because the kingdom of God was getting ready to hit the earth. And he was talking about what Jesus was going to bring, that the kingdom of darkness was going to be destroyed, that sin was going to be destroyed, and that he was going to usher in a new kingdom, a kingdom of righteousness, a kingdom of power, a kingdom of love, and this is what John the Baptist, so he would challenge the people, you need to repent of your sins, and you need to get ready, because I know you guys think that my water baptism is something so special. I know you guys are so impressed, and that's why thousands are coming to hear, but the one who's getting ready to come is not going to baptize with water. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize you with the fire of God Almighty. Do you understand what this means? We understand the concept. I mean, I've had a sense of the Holy Spirit in this house from, from the time that we walked in. It was about the second song. I really felt a, a rush of the Holy Ghost, and I, I feel it right here at this moment. But what it is, I mean, even we, we have this sense as we go different places, as we come into different atmospheres, like, hey, I feel like God is in this place. But what John said that Jesus was going to do, and many of you have already experienced this, when he says that he was going to baptize you, that means that you, you think about what happens when you're baptized in water right? They take you and they lower you down into the water. You're completely immersed. You're completely engulfed in this water. You come up out of this water and you're dripping with the water, 
right? It changes. I mean, your clothes, they're wet. Your hair is wet. Everything about you looks and, and is different. In fact, where they get the word baptized, I'm just going to teach you. I don't have this in my notes, but this will, this will help some of you out. Did you know that the word baptized before it was a Christian term was actually a kitchen term? That's right. What it was, it was this picture of taking a cucumber putting it into a mixture of vinegar and and other spices, and as it soaks there in the vinegar, it begins to absorb the nutrients. It begins to absorb the attributes of the liquid that it's soaking in, and when you bring it out sometime later, it's no longer a cucumber. What is it? It's a pickle. And so essentially what happens is when we are baptized, what we're saying is that we want to be immersed in the nutrients and the attributes of God Almighty. And that when we come out, we look different, we smell different, we we think different, and that we literally permeate. We've been pickled, church. Now, that's water baptism. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit is very, very much the same. That this spirit that we would see in the Old Testament, it would come upon Elijah, and now he's calling down fire. It would come upon Moses, and now he's splitting a sea. It would come upon the prophets, and they would prophesy to nations and see things shift. He was saying, what John was saying is, Jesus who's coming. These stories that you read about in the Old Testament, it's not just going to be for a select few, but for all who would receive him. You can be baptized. You can be immersed. You can be overwhelmed. You can be overcome. It can permeate. The power of the Holy Spirit and the fire of God Almighty can literally come into and flow out of your being. Do you understand this, church? My wife hates it when I eat pickles before I come to bed. Why? Because she can smell it, you know, and I always want to give her a kiss before she goes in. She just can't stand it. I don't want to smell like pickles and all this. But what happens is, is you get this in you. Everybody around you is going to smell it. Everybody around you is going to know that something has transpired. And so understand that John the Baptist, for six months, every day, crowds were gathering. And every day, his message was, there's somebody who's getting ready to come. And this is his ministry. He's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit and fire. So can you imagine how exciting it was the day that Jesus comes walking by and he says, that's the man. That's the one that we've been waiting for. There he is right there. And he left actually that day. And where we picked up in our verse today was actually the second day in a row that Jesus had come and he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And two of John's disciples, one we know was Andrew, the other I think was actually the writer of this gospel, John. And uh, But these two guys, they immediately left John the Baptist and they began to follow after Jesus. And this is where we pick up our story today. And so... I love this. Jesus, if you, if you have your Bibles open there, you'll see. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned, and seeing them following, he said to them, What do you seek? What do you seek? Church, if you and I are going to be fishers of men, this is the first thing that Jesus is going to do for us. He is going to check our motives. Jesus is going to check our motives. This is an important question. What are you seeking? What do you want from me? It comes to a, there comes a point in every one of our lives, if we're determined to follow after Jesus, that he is going to, to challenge us, what do you want? You notice with blind Bartimaeus, when, when he was crying out, Jesus called for him, and he said, what do you want? Bartimaeus had to think clearly about what his response was going to be. I don't know if you guys have ever been under pressure where you've tried to get a meeting with somebody important. Maybe it's a job interview. You meet with somebody that you respect or you get a chance to sit down and hang out with a celebrity or, or something like this. But I've had these moments where finally I get to sit down with this in person of influence and it's like, okay, now what do I ask? And you know that this moment is is precious. You know that you may only have a small window of opportunity. And you don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't want to ask for the wrong thing. Have you ever thought if you were in the position of Solomon? Remember when God came to Solomon? And he said, Solomon, ask, what do you want? He could have asked for anything in that moment. He could have said, God, I I want to be the wealthiest man on the face of the earth. He could have said, God, I I want to, you know, I I want a new donkey. I mean, he could have asked for a whole lot of things there in that that moment. But 
What did he do? I, I, I don't know how long that he thought about this, but he knew what his response was going to be. Have you ever thought that if God were going to come to you and to ask you, he appears to you in a dream or an angel comes to you, and, hey, God wants to know, he'll give you anything, what do you want? What would your answer be? I've thought about it a lot, and honestly, I don't know. I, I don't know. I should figure out what I, what I would say in that moment. Uh, I might just copy Solomon and say wisdom, because not only did God give him that, but he gave him a whole lot of other things. He gave him influence. He gave him wealth. He gave him all of these kinds of things. But Jesus here, these men leave John the Baptist. They begin to follow Jesus, and he says, what do you seek? Church, we need to know. We need to know. I, I would challenge you this morning. Why have you come into church today? Are you doing it to appease somebody else? Are you doing it to fulfill an obligation? Are you doing it simply, uh, well, I don't want to go to hell at the end of my life? All of those are okay reasons, but there comes a time where Jesus is going to get very personal with you. And he's going to say, what do you desire from me? What are you seeking from me? And church, I hope that you've got an answer for that. I mean, my, my, my list would be kind of longer if I was talking to Jesus about why I'm seeking him and what I want to see him do. But God will check our motives. In fact, the Bible says this is, this is real important. It's important. You know your words matter? You know your words matter? This is what the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And then there's another verse. This is long. I've got it up there on the screen for you. It says, uh, James 3, 3. We can make a large horse go wherever we want to by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong, in the same way the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. The tongue is a flame of fire. It is the whole world. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting the entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. That's not good fire, by the way. For it is set on fire by hell itself. Church, what you say is very important. What comes out of your mouth is so incredibly important. And I would challenge you, even as God begins to, as you begin to follow after Jesus, there's going to come these moments in time. He says, why are you following me? What do you desire from me? Saying that I want to escape judgment is a good thing, okay? I don't want to go to hell, Jesus. Saying things like, Jesus, I just want to be closer to you. I want to learn from you. I want to be near. Those are all wonderful responses. But really and truly, what do you desire from Jesus? Lord, I want you in my business. God, I need you to touch my marriage. Lord, I, I need you to, to strengthen my physical body. Lord, I, I need my kids. I, I want to know that my family is born again and, and going after you. God, I need you to comfort me in this moment. I, I'm in the storm of my life, and I don't know where to look. If Jesus were to come and to challenge you and say, what's in your heart today? And what do you desire from me today? Church, our words are very important. In fact, one of the things that I, I, I want to, I, I saw this just, uh, I was reading this just the other day in, my, in one of my daily reading plans. Uh, you remember when the angel came, the, the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. And Zechariah went into the temple, and he was performing the temple duties, right, the, the sacrifices, the incense, and all of this kind of, and the angel Gabriel appears to him and begins to prophesy, begins to speak to him what God is intending to do, that he's going to give him a son. Now, he and his wife Elizabeth were, were old, and so this was going to be a miracle if God were to do this. But he said, he says, I'm going to give you a child, and this is what your child is going to do, and begins to prophesy about John the Baptist and how he was going to lay the ground for Jesus in his ministry and how it was going to be an essential part of the ministry of Jesus. And if you guys remember, there was a point of doubt within Zechariah. And what happened there? The angel shut his mouth. He literally muted his tongue so that he did not speak until John the Baptist was born. And on the day that they asked what they should name him, because it was normal for them to name them after the father. They thought his name would be Zachariah or one of the other relatives. But when the mother said, no, his name is going to be John, and then they turned to Zachariah, is this right? This doesn't seem right. And he says, no, his name is John. The people marveled. And at that moment, his tongue was loosed. Why? It was the fulfillment of of the word. And I'm telling you, you want to know why? This is what I believe. I believe the reason the angel shut the mouth of Zechariah 
was so that he didn't say something stupid that would come in the way of God's prophetic word. You understand that God can say, you can have a prophet say, hey, this is what God's going to do in your life. This is what the Lord's going to do. But if you immediately go into speaking things of doubt and unbelief and criticism, oh, this could never happen. Oh, I'm too old for this to happen. I'm too young for this to happen. I'm too dumb for this to happen. You begin speaking these things. I'm telling you guys, you could disrail God's will for your life before you even get on track. Sometimes, it's like what my my mom and what your mom probably used to tell you. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And I'm telling you, if you can't speak a word of faith, sometimes it's better to just shut your mouth. Well, I can't agree with this, but I'm not going to disagree with it. I'm just going to be quiet for a minute until God works some faith on the inside of me. Are you hearing me this morning? God's going to challenge you. He's going to say, I-, I want you to check your motives. Where are you going? Uh, and so this was part of what, what he did. What do you want? What do you desire of Jesus? And then he continues this, the passage uh, uh, out of John. And they say to him, Rabbi, which is translated teacher. And they say, where are you staying? And he said to them, Jesus said, come and see. They came and they saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. The second point this morning, if you desire to be a fisher of men, um, know that Jesus has an open invitation for all. Jesus has given an open invitation to everybody. I want you to picture this right here. This, uh, you know, they're, they're following after Jesus. How many think that's a good thing? They responded to the altar call. Jesus is walking by, come, follow me. John has already said, their their existing pastor essentially has said, hey, that's the guy who we're all going to be following. He's the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And they all begin to follow after Jesus. And Jesus doesn't warmly welcome and embrace them immediately. He turns around and he says, what do you want? Many of us, I'm telling you guys, if you started coming into the church and my first words to you were, well, what are you doing here? How many of you would stick around in this church? Wow, what a loving church. Welcome home, right? But you know what? I think it's amazing. I think they had a really good response to this. They said, Jesus, where are you staying? Are you in town for just a little bit? Or are you going to be here for a little while? Where are you staying? You know what they were, you know what they were doing? And this is so wise. They said, Jesus, let us hang out with you. Before we tell you what we desire to see and what we do, let us just come in and, and spend some time with you. And you know what Jesus' response was? Immediately he said, come and see. Come, I'll show you. See, in this day and age, I don't know why it is, guys, and I'm, I'm talking about my generation, and that, that, that fits a handful of you here in this room, but I don't know why it is and how we have grown so thin-skinned in this last decade or so. I don't know what it is, and now everything offends everybody and every word, and many people, if Jesus gave a simple challenge, what do you want? We would say, well, you're supposed to know what I want, Jesus. I thought you were a prophet. Can't you just read my mind? You're supposed to tell me what I want. We would, get, we would just get so offended, and many people would, would walk away, and they'd give a bad review on Google and Yelp and all this kind of stuff. I'm never going back to that place. That pastor doesn't even care. He put a challenge out to them. I want you to check your heart. What's in your heart? Why are you following me? And their response was, Jesus, we want to be close to you. We just want to spend some time with you. And guys, I say this almost every morning. If you ever join us for early morning prayer, you should. We've had between 17 and 20 almost every day this last week. We've got a good, strong early morning prayer. And uh, I would love for you to join. But one of the things that I say so frequently in that prayer gathering is that, yeah, we're going to pray for stuff. We're going to ask God Yes, provide the financial needs for this house, Lord. Uh, uh, heal our bodies and, and meet our needs and, uh, and minister to marriages and, and, and touch our youth and minister in the schools. And we pray for all of these things uh, uh, very often. But one of the things that I never want to get, uh, just I, I don't always want to be seeking, God, what's in your hand? What blessing do you have for me today? What can I get from you? And forget what it's like to sometimes just come and sit in his presence. To not just look for what's in his hand, but just to gaze upon his face. 
to sit on his lap, to do as, as John the Revelator did where he just, he, he, he snuggles up to Jesus and he leans upon him, his head on his breast, hearing his heart beat. I'm, guys, we need to learn to, to keep that posture. It's fine to ask God for stuff. It's his nature to heal and to bless and to give. But I'm telling you, we need to keep our heart in a place where it says, Jesus, I, I, what I want from you and what I want is not just what you can give me, but I, I want you. I want to be with you. I want to, I want to spend time with you. So these guys, they had, a, they had a good response. Now, I just want to encourage you guys in, in something. Jesus gave an open invitation to every single one of these disciples. And I, I, I've got a real, I'm just going to give you a real life application for this, okay? What you can do with this. Do you know? There is an open invitation for every single one of you to partner with what God is getting ready to do here in Lahaina. I just want you to know this. Whether you've received it or not, you don't have to be a part of a special club. It's not like only those who get a special invitation to my house get invited to to do. Every single one of you, I don't care if it's your first time. we got several first-time guests here today. If you're a first-time guest or if you were here for 30 years, or maybe you were close to the guy who was pastor two, two pastors ago or whatever, guys, I'm, I'm telling you, you have a place within this house and what God wants to do here. Do you hear me on this? You know, I, I, I just, the, 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 there was a story Dr. Morocco told, uh, he was sharing uh, about Nathan Morris coming. Guys, he'll be here for our youth conference. Don't miss that week. If you've never heard Nathan Morris, I mean, he's a, he's a fiery evangelist, a mighty man of God. He's gonna, it'll bless your life. He'll be, he'll be in the cathedral for, uh, uh, I think, four nights, Sunday through Wednesday. And, uh, and it's going to be an amazing time. But one of the things that he was talking about was that Nathan, he had a great revival that broke out in Mobile, Alabama. My wife and I went down there when this was going on, rocked on for a little over a year. Powerful move of God. The interesting thing was, and I didn't, I didn't know this, but uh, uh, the power of God was breaking out in all of Nathan's meetings. He was seeing healings take place. He was seeing people touched by the fire of God. But what happened was when he got there to that meeting, what happened is the power of God began to move, and so they added another night to this. Everybody came back. In fact, not just everybody came back, but they added a couple hundred people. There were more people who gathered on a Monday night. And then on a Tuesday night, everybody came together. Nathan Morris was actually supposed to come to Maui to preach in the cathedral that next Sunday. But they ended up calling him around Wednesday or Thursday, and they said, Dr. Morocco, God is really doing something profound here in Mobile. Do you mind if we uh, postpone our meeting? And, uh, you know, he didn't ever pick it up for the better part of a year because they went into those extended meetings. And, guys, some of the craziest miracles documented, people coming out of wheelchairs, blind eyes being uh, uh, open. I mean, just wild kind of stuff transpired in that revival. But the thing that caught my attention, you want to know how Nathan knew. You want to know how the pastor knew that they were to continue those meetings and, and not come here or not go to the next place or not do that was because everybody showed up. Everybody wanted to be a part. And even as, as Dr. Morocco was relaying this story, my mind immediately went back to, to, to Steve Hill and the Brownsville revival. And that's what Jerry Hill told us on one occasion, that, that everywhere they were going, the power of God was breaking out in every single one of their services. But the reason they knew that they were to stay there in Brownsville is when they called a Monday night meeting, when they called a Tuesday night meeting. 80 to 90% of the entire church showed up. They were ready to host a move of God. Now listen, my wife and I have never felt so strongly that God was going to do something so profound than we have in our life in the reason that we came here. I'm telling you, guys, the prophetic words that we were receiving, and even as we stepped foot in here, I was sharing with the church the first few weeks. You can go back and listen to some of those messages. I was sharing with the church the things that God had shown me, the prophecies that he had spoken to my wife and I about this tidal wave of revival coming, about moving into multiple services, about the presence and the power of God breaking out. And what amazed me was I had individuals from the congregation who began to come to me, and they said, oh, a prophet was here seven years ago ago and they said the same prophetic word over this house years ago and they began to guys as we've begun to pray into these things I realize this isn't just uh, uh, words that God has spoken to me and my wife 
This is the Lord's intention over this house and over this people. And the reason that I share all of those things is to say, there's an open invitation for you to partner with what God is going to do here as he begins to pour out historic revival. It's not going to work if I've just got me and 20 other people at early morning prayer who are excited and, ex- and, and praying that God pour out his spirit. It's going to require a congregation of people. Because you know what's going to happen? This is something I pray for every day. I pray, God, fill this house. Draw in the lost and the broken and the hurting. Draw in those who desperately need you. Draw in the addict. Draw in those who have no hope. Draw in those whose whose marriages are about to fall apart. Draw in those that that no other church wants because they're a nuisance, because they they come in smelling uh, uh, like smoke, because they come in and and they're out of their minds. Lord, we'll take those people. I pray that every day. One of the things that is constantly brought into my heart, remember, we were praying in, 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 our, in our previous church. It was a large church. We averaged about 7,000, and they were praying that 11,000 would gather on Easter Sunday. And so we were praying, and all of the ministries were laying out their goals, and, well, this is what we're going to do Easter Sunday. This is what youth department, this is what children's, and all of these departments were sharing. This is how we're going to do our part to reach 11,000 on Easter Sunday. And I'll never forget because the pastor's wife began to weep right in the middle of this staff meeting. And everybody just kind of got quiet as they realized, man, what's, what's up with Pastor Becky here? And she stood up and she said, guys, I'm glad that we have a goal to reach 11,000 souls on Easter Sunday. But my question is, and she challenged the entire staff, my question is, are we ready to love 11,000 souls. And boy, that caused me and everybody else to take a step back. Boy, we could promote an event and we can have fun games and all this kind of stuff and we can draw a crowd. We can do that, church. We can do that. But are we ready to love the people that come into this house? I feel like this church is very good at this, but I, you, you must challenge yourself. If you see somebody come walking in through these doors and they don't look like you, they don't smell like you, they don't have the same background as you, are you ready to say, God, I'm going to open up my life to this individual. I'm going to help them connect to a ministry or a life group that they need to. I'm going to have them over to my house for dinner. Are you ready to embrace people? Because, guys, I'm telling you, I can be on fire. I can have guys like John Harkey. It was a word that was given two weeks ago. You got the spirit of a revivalist on the inside of you. He's prophesying over me and Leah. Guys, we're going to get this stuff all the time. I know that's what God has called me to do. I walk confidently in that. But I'm telling you, if we don't have a body that is ready to carry what the Lord is going to do, I can be a fire-breathing revivalist all day long, but it won't matter if we don't have a people, if we don't have a house that is being fitted together and ready to carry what God is going to do. Do you hear me? God's going to pour out historic revival here in Lahaina. I need you to be a part of it. I need you to love on some people that are going to come within the realm of this ministry. Here's the last thing this morning. When you accept the invitation to be a fisher of men, this is what Jesus will do. Jesus will give you a new name in a new identity. He'll give you a new name and a new identity. I love what he said about Peter. He said uh, when the two heard John speak, they followed him, Andrew, Simon, his uh, Peter's brother. He found his brother Simon. He says, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. He said, uh, and brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. I like this, guys. If you know, if you've ever studied the life of Peter, these are the words that I would use to describe Peter. You can feel free to add to this list if you like. I would consider Peter brash. I would consider Peter flighty. I would consider Peter moody. I would consider Peter angry, right? Anybody add, add, a, add, a, add, what do you, anybody add to that list? Uh, I mean, cocky. There you go. That's a good. I mean, listen. Peter's a guy, I mean, he, he wanted to do right, you know. Oh, they're coming against my Jesus, pulling out the sword and lopping off ears. And uh, I think he was probably swinging for the neck. But, I mean, this guy was just, he was, he was out of reaction. And within 24 hours, he's denying Jesus and cussing out people. And, uh, I mean, this is, this is the apostle Peter. 
Do you think that Jesus knew that Peter was like that when he called him? Absolutely he did. Absolutely he did. Peter, I know you got an anger issue. I know that you're wishy-washy. I know that you're cocky. I know that you're, that you're this and, the, and you're that. But listen, you're not Peter anymore. I'm calling you the rock. You're rocky now, Peter. You know, I mean, this is, this is what he said. You know, if, and he, he, complete, he gave him a new name. He gave him a new identity. You think about what he did when he, when, he encountered a, when he encountered Jacob. You know, here's a deceiver. Here's a liar. Here's a man who's running from his family. But he says, no, I'm now going to call you Israel, one who prevails with God. What did he do to Abraham? He had a destiny and a purpose on Abraham's life. I'm no longer going to call you Abram. I'm going to call you Abraham. You're going to be the father of a multitude of nations. Guys, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier. What's on our lips matters. What our tongue utters matters. Are you declaring what your daddy called you? You're an idiot. You're a failure. You're always going to be this. You're always going to be that. Or are you receiving in yourself the identity that Christ has given you? Guys, I I could go on all day long talking about my deficiencies and how I fail, but I also know that God has spoken destiny and purpose in a new name. And those are the things that I'm trying to grab hold of today. Now, I don't know if God will give you literally a new name, but I will tell you this. God's got some plans, and he's got a purpose for your life. And you come to Jesus while the enemy, all these guys would like to remind you of, of how you failed and what your deficiencies are, I'm telling you guys, what Jesus is going to do, he's going he's to come to you and he's going to begin to reveal to you, you're my, you're my son. You're my daughter. You belong to me. I, I love what... I love the fact that even when he came to Jesus upon his baptism and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus had not yet worked a miracle. Jesus had not yet preached a sermon. Jesus had done nothing, but the father knew the plan and the purpose that he had for his son. And he began to declare those things over. This is my son. I'm well pleased in him. And I'm telling you, church, I don't know if you've done great things for the Lord or if you've done nothing for the Lord, but I believe the Lord's declaration over you is, you're my son. You're my daughter. You might be brash and angry and cocky and all of these things, but no. I'm going to call you rock. I'm going to call you prevailer with God. I'm going to call you on fire revivalist. I'm going to call you worshiper. I'm going to call you, I'm going to call you entrepreneur. I, I don't know what the Lord's declaration over you is, but this is what I want to do. I, I'd like if my worship team would come. I want everybody to, to stand across this room right now. And we're going to pray. And what I'm going to begin to do is I'm going to, I'm going to give everybody an invitation. And what I, what I'm hoping is that we'll see some individuals who say, you know what? I'm going to follow Jesus. And I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but I want to be a fisher of men. I want God to use me for his plans and for his purposes. And what I'm going to ask the Lord to do, and this is, this is real specific. If you're here today and you feel like the declaration over your life has been something like you're worthless, or you're weak, you're not smart enough, you're a failure. You know, what what blows my mind is I lived for many years, and I thought, I want you to listen to me carefully on this, okay? This is going to change some of your life. Hear me. You are not your desires. Your identity is not found in in your desires. And what I mean by that, I used to think for a long time, I was looking for identity. I was looking for purpose. And so when I began using drugs, I just thought that that's who I am now. That is my identity. I'm a, I'm a pothead, and I was, I was proud of it. I wore the necklace and the stupid shirts and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, that's my identity. That is who I am. It's not who I am. My desires, because the thing about desires is desires change over time. 
I mean, when I was five years old, I wanted to, I don't know, like be a dinosaur or something. I, don't, I mean, I, when I was five, I, my desires were goofy. When I was 18, I wanted to be a rock star. Guys, that couldn't be further from what I, what I believe and what I desire today. Your desires are not who you are. This is where so many people who struggle in their sexuality, they feel like, I desire this sex same, same sex relationship, or I, I feel like my, my desires are telling me that I'm, I'm supposed to be a woman even though I'm in a man's body. Guys, you are not what your desires are. Your desires can change over time. The question is, and this is why I think so many people want this, everybody wants to know what their identity is in Christ. Everybody wants to know it. They may not know how to word that. And this is why, well, I'm going to become this sin or I'm going to become this type of person. You're not your desires. Desires change. You are who God says that you are. So what I want to do is I want to pray. And if you say, you know what? I want to hear the Lord's affirmation. I want to hear what God's declaration over my life is. I just, I want to pray. And I, I don't know how long we'll, we'll take with this. I know we've got lunch and all of this kind of stuff, so I, I'm not going to drag this out, but I really felt like what I wanted to do was lay hands on people today. And I want to ask that if you've ever struggled with your identity, if you've ever struggled with, man, I, I feel like I identify with my sin or my struggle or, or my failure or what my dad called me, what my mom called me, what my ex-wife called me, you know, if you feel like you identify with Something negative. The devil's harassing you and saying, oh, no, this is what you are and this is what you'll always be. What we're going to do is we're going to break every word that the enemy has spoken. And what I'm going to pray is that God would begin to open your, your heart and your mind to hear and to receive what is God's declaration over your life. Does that make sense? This is what I want to do. If you're here, I'm not going to twist anybody's arm to come down here. But if, if you're here and you say, you know what, I, I want to hear I want to hear the Father's affirmation that I'm his, I'm his son, I'm his daughter, and I want to hear what his plan. I just want you to come down to this altar right now and just line up right across the front here. Yeah. yeah. Like a fire, shut up in my bones. I want the world to know you are God. With a power. too late if you're still here and, and, and you say you know what I, I feel like I'm supposed to be down there uh, you still have an opportunity this isn't like a, a one time and you miss it forever okay no these altars are going to stay open and we're just going to pray quickly what I'm going to believe you know I I heard a neat testimony from from Jacob Kopp who uh, I think he's helping with the youth out there oh you know he's right here but he was just telling me this this last week, just, he's like, I had a dream last night. And, uh, you know, he's told me a couple other times that he's had dreams that, that have come from God. And I, I asked him, I'm like, Jacob, you're, you, you dream a lot, don't you? And he's like, I never used to. But he's like, when I started coming here to this church, it's like God just started speaking to me through dreams. He's like, I have one or two dreams a week. And uh, his wife, even more than that. And I'm telling you guys, what's going to happen here is... Uh, there's going to be a, a shift in the heavens that happens over you. If, if, I, if God drops a prophetic word in my heart, I'll, I'll give it. But I'm telling you, for some of you, it's going to be simply that 
It's like the heavens open over you, and you may start having dreams, or you may be in prayer, and God just really starts to build up. Oh, no, you're courageous. You're not fearful like you think you are. You're you're, you're bold and you're strong. You're not a coward like you think you are. You're not not arrogant like somebody says, oh, no, you're, you're operating in meekness and in power, you know. God may just start dropping things in your heart when you're in a place of prayer. That's the shift that's going to happen. But what I'm going to what I'm going to do is I want to lead everybody here in a prayer. And we're just going to simply renounce every lying word, every deceiving word, every hurtful word. We're just going to we're going to grab a hold of these and we're going to cast them down to the ground because that's not who you are any longer. I want to lead you in a prayer. If you're watching online, if you're here in these altars, you pray this with me. Everybody's welcome to pray this, but I want you to repeat after me. Pray, "Dear Jesus, I thank you. I am called. I am highly favored. I am your son. I'm your daughter. I thank you, Jesus, that today there's a change happening. There's a transformation happening. You're going to begin to open my mind and my heart to who I am and who you've called me to be. Right now, I take hold of every lying word and I cast it to the ground. I take hold of every slanderous or every abusive word and I declare it has no hold on my life. It does not define who I am. That's not my name. You're giving me a new name, Lord. I take hold of every ungodly thought and every ungodly declaration and I cast it to the ground. I will not carry that name any longer. Today, I ask you, Lord, to reveal your identity, your declaration, your desires for my life. Lord, I give myself to you. Live your life through me. Let me find identity as your son or daughter. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.